Okay, this is a lecture from fifth hour class on April the 19th. Um, anyway, um, the armistice was signed uh, on uh, November the 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock in the morning. But the war didn't end. And I want you to get that clear in your heads. The armistice did not uh, end World War I. Everybody stayed put. Nobody retreated. Neither side was defeated. The Germans were where they had been for four years. The British and the French were where they had been for four years with the addition of the more and more Americans spilling in on their side. This was just a ceasefire. And again, that was in uh, November of 1918. The shooting stopped, but the treaty uh, to end the war, and there must be a treaty to end the war, will be written from January until June of 1919. Technically, the war does not end until June 28, 1919, the day that the Germans signed, and we'll talk all about this, the day that the Germans signed the Treaty of Versailles. And so when the armistice is signed in January of 1919, uh, four men gathered at Versailles Palace to write the treaty that would end the war. And Woodrow Wilson represented the United States. These are the big four, Orlando, uh, Italy, uh, and Clemenceau, France, and uh, David Lloyd George. Have we talked any about David Lloyd George? Okay, you know who he was. Okay, uh, those four people gathered at Versailles to write the final treaty that would end that would end the war. Of course, Orlando uh, suffered under a language barrier. He knew very little English, even though they had interpreters. It could have been difficult for him. Uh, but Wilson and Clemenceau uh, fought fought it out uh, there at Versailles. Uh, Clemenceau was there for one reason and one reason only, and that was to crush Germany as a military power, and he succeeds in doing that. Uh, Wilson was there with the 14 points and the League of Nations. He wanted a just and lasting peace, uh, which are those are admirable goals. Uh, but that's that's you know uh, you know Clemenceau thought Wilson was naive. He said he's the leader of the nation that lost the fewest number of men. They weren't in the war for six months. Why in the world does he think he can come to Versailles and dictate to us, the actual Europeans who have been through this war, what's going to happen at the end of the war? So those two fought all the time. And when I mean fought, you know, Wilson was over there probably snapping pencils. And this guy, he's in his 80s, uh, but he would get so angry at Wilson, he would pound the table. And sometimes it seemed like he was going to, going to lunge across uh, the table and uh, attack Wilson. Um, and, um, you know, Wilson threatened to go home. He got so angry. Clemenceau did go home. Of course, he just lived in Paris, but he, he went, he left the conference for two weeks and then he came back and uh, he and Wilson immediately got into another argument. He decides to go walk out in the very beautiful gardens of Versailles and, uh, he's out there walking and there's an anarchist. And I'll tell you about this. There's an anarchist hiding in the bushes and he steps out and he shot Clemenceau. Uh, and Clemenceau's in his 80s, and they rush him to a hospital, and they dig out the bullet, and three days later, he's back at the table, banging on the table, uh, yelling yelling at, uh, at Wilson. Of course, Lloyd George was sitting there, the British prime minister, and he's watching it. He's like somebody sitting in a tennis match, watching these two guys go at each other. And finally, he got so sick of it that he couldn't stand it any longer, and he made the excuse. He said, I'm going to go home to take care of some government matters over in the British Parliament. So I'm going to take a couple of weeks off, and he did. He was sitting in the House of Commons looking rather glum, just with his shoulders slumped down, and one of his colleagues came up to him and said, well, Prime Minister, how are the peace negotiations going on over at Versailles? And he gave this classic line. He said, oh, he said, they're going just fine, considering that I've been sitting between Jesus Christ and Napoleon for the last six weeks. That's how he described Wilson, all these high-flown ideas, peace, love, charity, and Clemenceau on the other side banging the table. We got to, de to destroy Germany. We got to destroy Germany. He said, I've been sitting in the middle of that. So he said, I guess all things considered, things are going okay. Well, it took him six months to write this treaty. And of course, these four men have been criticized roundly ever since. And I would love to take Wilson to task because Woodrow Wilson is one of my least favorite presidents. I think he, Woodrow Wilson has, and I'll just say this and then go on, but Woodrow Wilson has had a role. He has played a role in every foreign policy failure the United States has had in the last 100 years. If you think Woodrow Wilson's up there in the National Cathedral buried under all that marble, he's not. He's got his hands all over U.S. foreign policy. 
uh, Afghanistan is the latest thing. What did we go to? What did we say we went to Afghanistan for? To spread democracy. How did that turn out? Not good after 20 years. Now that's Woodrow Wilson. Make the world safe for democracy. If you don't think Woodrow Wilson uh, is uh, from the grave to a large extent directing American foreign policy, you you either know you don't know one or two things. You don't know who Woodrow Wilson is, or you don't know who what what American foreign policy is. But anyway, um, I'd love to take Wilson to task. He and Thomas Jefferson, they're two of my least favorite presidents. Um, but I can't. You know, in in all of reality, these people did the best that they could do. There, there probably weren't four men alive on the earth then or now. You couldn't pick the four most brilliant people, men and women on the earth, and put them in a room today, put them in a time machine and send them back to Versailles, and they couldn't have done one bit better than the big, than the big four did. They had an impossible task. They had to create new nations. They had to tear down old empires. And they had to decide the fate. They had to decide the fate of over 400 million people. Just think about that responsibility. Next time you're sitting at one of our insufferable uh, homecoming float buildings and you watch the chaos and the turmoil over how much chicken pot wire and tissue paper we're gonna get, those Titanic issues, imagine being in these guys' uh, shoes and having to uh, essentially create a new world order. They didn't invite the Russians because the Russians were communists. They didn't invite the Germans because the Germans, quote, were sent the, the central powers and they had lost the war. How in the world, just think about this, how in the world can you decide the future of Europe? If I can get them out. How in the world can you decide the future of Europe and leave out Germany and Russia? Well, the answer to that is you can't. You can't. Uh, and so the final treaty was 230 pages long. It wasn't a single sheet of paper. It was 200, it was a book, 230 pages long. And it looked nothing, get this down, it looked nothing like the 14 points. And by the way, that's what the, Ger the Germans read Wilson's 14 points, and that's what they were counting on. They, uh, and of course, when the, the, when, the, when the finished version of this treaty comes out, it looked nothing like the 14 points. Get this down, it crushed Germany. It crushed them. Uh, Clemenceau achieved his goal. And in, and, and in the process, this treaty sowed the seeds for the rise of Adolf Hitler in World War II. Listen, Adolf Hitler, and this always surprises me, people think that Hitler got together a bunch of stormtroopers and he stormed into the German Reichstag and he seized power by force. Adolf Hitler was elected by the German people, just like he was elected just like Joe Biden or Donald Trump or George Bush or Barack Obama. He campaigned and he won the election. He was elected chancellor of Germany. And by the way, when he was running, he said nothing about the Jews. He said nothing about the Jews. He didn't say, I'm going to start this, the greatest war in history and mass murder half the Jews on the earth. He didn't say that. You know what he talked about? He said, if you elect me, I'm going to do away with the Treaty of Versailles. And they elected him and he did away with the Treaty of Versailles. And in the process, started the greatest war in human history, World War II, and he mass murdered 15 million people. 15, and that's that's just the people that he mass murdered. That doesn't count the other 60 million people who died in combat in the war. You know, uh, 15 million people, I'll just put this up here, it always surprises me about the Holocaust. Uh, of the 15 million people that died in the camps and were put in the ovens and turned to ashes, 6 million of them were Jews. Uh, the, uh, the Jews were the largest single group. But the majority, this always surprises people, but it's true. The majority of people who died in the Holocaust were not Jews. Uh, they were uh, other nationalities. A good number of them were Germans. Hitler said, I'm going to create the master race. We can't have uh, anybody uh, that's walking around on crutches. We can't have anybody that, that is mental, mentally retarded. That looks bad on the master race. And so uh, he exterminated them. Some of the first people, to, the concentration the camps that you've all heard about uh, weren't built at first for, for Jews. Uh, they were built for, uh, in quote, inferior Germans, uh, inferior Germans. And so he slaughtered uh, uh, millions. Uh, but, uh, you know, he didn't talk about that. Well, Wilson signed the treaty, get this down, and he knew it was terrible. He knew he'd signed a bad treaty. But what, what was in the treaty that Wilson said will solve all the problems. I know this is a horrible treaty. I know it's terrible. But what, what did they include in the treaty at the end of it, as I say, wagging its crippled tail to get Wilson to go along with it? 
the League of Nations. Write that down. And Wilson said, as long as – I know this is a terrible treaty, but as long as there is a League of Nations, as long as there is a League of Nations, the League will solve all the problems brought about by the treaty. And it didn't. Of course, there was a League of Nations. The United States, by the way, we never joined. It was our idea. We never joined the League of Nations. Uh, but the League of Nations existed until the beginning of World War II, and it didn't solve any problems. It didn't solve any problems. The Treaty of Versailles is one of the greatest failures in human history. So I want to talk about the Treaty of Versailles now. It's 230 pages long, uh, so I'm just going to give you the major points. But I want you to know, uh, essentially, what the treaty said. I'm going to hit the main points. And so the first thing, number one, just number these, one, two, three, whatever. Number one, this is the final, this is the final version of the Treaty of Versailles. Number one, it created modern Europe. The Treaty of Versailles created modern Europe. Look at this map real quick. I'll repeat that. But just look at this map. That's, that's what Europe looked like on the day they started writing the Treaty of Versailles in January of 1919. That's what Europe looked like six months later. That's what Europe looked like. So look at that. That's a huge difference. That's what Europe looks like in January of 1919. That's what Europe looks like in uh, June of 1919. Um, if you backpack across Europe today, once this war is over maybe, but if you and your friends, you ought to do it, backpack across Europe and see Europe. The Europe you cross in 2022 will be that. There are a couple of differences. There's no longer a Yugo, whoops, there's no longer a Yugoslavia. It's been divided. It's broken into about six countries. There's no longer Czechoslovakia. It's divided about right here. You have the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. But other than that, what you see here still holds. And that was created by the Treaty of Versailles. So get this down. Uh, they took territory. That is, the Treaty of Versailles took territory away from Germany. It's important. I want you to know which territory. I'm going to do them one, two, three. Here we go. Look at this real quick. Took territory away from Germany. Look at that right there. That's a strip of territory on the border of Germany and France. That's a strip of territory on the border of Germany and France. Clemenceau said, I want that demilitarized. Write this down. Demilitarized. So I want to take that away from Germany since it's right on the border with France. And I want it demilitarized. What does the word demilitarized mean? What does that mean? Clemenceau wanted what there? What does demilitarized mean? You ever heard that word? We well, have today. What do you think it means? To take away their military. Yeah, no military. Get to the, no military can be there. This is going to be a buffer zone between France and Germany. But they took that territory away from Germany. That piece of territory, get this down, is called the Rhineland. The Rhineland. Okay. So the Rhineland is taken away from Germany. And 15 years later, get all this down. 15 years later, Hitler takes it back. 15 years later, Hitler takes it back. This is Hitler's first, the Rhineland is Hitler's first territorial conquest. It's the first piece of territory he ever conquered. And by the way, the, there was a League of Nations in 1936, uh, the United States it was, it was not part of it, but all these nations had a League of Nations. And when Hitler went into the Rhineland, that's the first piece of territory he ever conquered. When Hitler went into the Rhineland, the League of Nations protested. They said to Hitler, you can't do that. And you know what he said? He said, I'm just taking back territory that the Treaty of Versailles took away from Germany. If you've been keeping up with international politics lately, right here in Russia, one of the excuses that Vladimir Putin has used to invade uh, the um, uh, Ukraine, was that in 1991, this was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union owned all of this. And in 1991, the Soviet Union lost the Cold War, and they lost all that territory. In the last 10 years, people have hardly noticed he took back Crimea. Uh, he took back a little region here called Georgia. And now he's gone big time, and he's taking the Crimea, or not Crimea, excuse me, uh, Ukraine, which sits right here. And his excuse every time has been, this is Vladimir Putin, I'm simply taking back, I'm simply taking back territory that was taken from us in 1991 when the Cold War ended. Same argument. And by the way, I want to make this clear. I'm not saying that Vladimir Putin is Hitler. 
You know, every time there's somebody that we don't like today, we say they're Hitler. Obama is Hitler. Uh, Trump is Hitler. Uh, Joe Biden is Hitler. Uh, and on and on we could go with the list. Uh, there's only one Hitler. Uh, Vladimir Putin wouldn't make a wart on Hitler's nose when it comes to being addicted. So there's only one Hitler. And it's the easiest thing in the world to see somebody that does bad things and say, well, that, there's another Hitler. No, they're not. But I'll tell you this. That said, Vladimir Putin has taken a playbook out of Hitler, has taken a page, excuse me, out of Adolf Hitler's playbook. He's taken that out. And that, you know, he's using the same excuse that Hitler used to take the Rhineland and other territories. Get this down right here. Look at that right there. You see that? Can everybody see that right there? Okay. Get this down. One of the, one of the um, countries created by the Treaty of Versailles was the nation of Czechoslovakia. And that's easy to spell. Czecho Slovakia. I could, if I had the time, I could go down and teach the kindergartners to do that by three o'clock today. So you're, you're sophomores, you can certainly do it. Czechoslovakia. That was just, and look, they took territory from Poland. They took territory from Austria. They took from Hungary to create this new country of Czechoslovakia. But look at that piece of territory they took right there. The Western, almost Western one half of Czechoslovakia, oh, well, that worked really well. The western one half of Czechoslovakia, they took from Germany. Get this down: the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland, and that's easy to spell too. Sudetenland, okay? Sudetenland. They took the Sudetenland away from Germany. And in 1938, get this down. In and rem remembering that World War II starts in 1939. In 1938, Hitler invaded the Sudetenland. He almost caused World War II a year early. And again, the League of Nations protested and said, you can't do that. And Hitler said, I'm just taking back territory that the Treaty of Versailles took away from Germany. The people in the Sudetenland, look, one day they were Germans and the next morning they woke up and they were part of Czechoslovakia. They spoke the German language. They had German customs and traditions. They were Germans. They were ethnically Germans. But the Treaty of Versailles made them into Czechoslovakians, okay? So Hitler's conquest of uh, the Sudetenland. And then finally, right up here, can you see that? Can you see that over? You see that white spot there? That's pretty good. All right, write this down. That's the Danzig Corridor. These are all, we're talking about territory taken away from Germany by the Treaty of the Danzig Corridor. Danzig Corridor. <clears throat> when they are creating modern Europe, look. You see that right there? Everybody see where my finger's moving there? That little yellow thing right there didn't exist. All of this was part of Germany. All of it. But since all of that was part of Germany, Poland was completely landlocked. They didn't have any access to the sea. And so what they decided to do was to take a little strip of Germany right here. My favorite, well, you see that yellow and white there. Take a little strip of Germany, get this down, and give it to Poland. They took that Danzig Corridor. Now, World War II lasted six years. It started on September 1st, 1939. When a German, a single German plane, this is the first shot of World War II. Think of all the people killed, millions dead, countries and continents destroyed. Think of all the chaos of World War II. And I can take you today to the place where the very first shot was fired. A lone German plane took off from Germany. It flew over the Danzig corner. And right there in that little white space you're looking at, it dropped a single bomb. And that was the first shot of a war that eventually killed 70 million people, 70 million people. Again, it was territory taken away from Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. So all those territories were taken away. Now get this down. So that's the first thing that the treaty does. Number two, takes away territory. Number two, the German army 
Well, just put it in, forget the German. Just Germany was disarmed. Okay, write this down. Germany is disarmed. And here's what I mean by that. According to the Treaty of Versailles, Germany could only have 100,000 men in their army. That's not very many people in the army. That's a small army. They could only have 100,000 people in that army. That army could not operate outside of Germany. It was for defensive purposes only. So the first thing is they essentially have to disband their army. Number two, get this down. They had to destroy their air force. And these planes were the old biplanes, the two wooden jobs. And so pilots literally had to take axes and go out and chop up their airplanes. And number three, they had to turn their Navy over to who? Which country got the German, the German Navy? No. England, write that down. They had to turn over their Navy to England. And you might recall, you might recall that for most of World War I, the British had blockaded Germany and the German fleet, well, there we go. The German, well, that's better. The German fleet was bottled up here in the Baltic Sea. They tried to make a run. Uh, that resulted in the Battle of Jutland, and the Germans were driven back. So for, for most of the war, the German Navy, absent their submarines, had been bottled up in the Baltic Sea. With the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, get this down, with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, Here's the way it was going to work. Look at this. Look at this real quick, and then I'll repeat it. The Germans were going to sail 50 ships. That was their name, 50 ships, <clears throat> north of Scotland, right up here to a place called Scapa Flow. So you can write that down. The, the, the way the treaty read, the Germans were going to sail their navy up north of Scotland. Well, now I've north of Scotland to a place called Scapa Flow. You don't have to write down Scapa Flow, but just up here to the North Sea. And the British Navy would be waiting on them. The British Navy would be waiting on them. And when the, when the German Navy got there, they would drop anchor, and the British would send over small boats and full of British sailors, and those British sailors would get on those German ships and take possession of them. The German sailors would get in those boats, same boats, and those boats would go back to the British Navy, and then the British Navy would deliver those German sailors back here to Germany. But the British Navy would take over the German fleet. And so on the day that this exchange was supposed to take place, the British Navy was lined up here. They didn't trust the Germans. They had all their guns, their big guns, battleships, all their guns pointing at the German fleet as it came steaming into Scapa Flow. And then the Germans stopped and they dropped anchor, and there was the German fleet from World War I. And the British are getting ready to get in boats and go over and take possession of that fleet. But the Germans at the last minute just could not bring themselves to turn over their navy to an enemy nation, and so they opened the valves on the inside of the ship, and they sunk their own fleet. If you want to see the Imperial German fleet from World War I today, I suggest you rent yourself a submarine, because that's what you're going to need to get to the Bot and you can go to the bottom of the North Atlantic. It's been sitting there since the summer of 1919. They sunk their ships rather than turn them over to the British. So Germany was completely disarmed. Okay, get this down. Germany was com almost completely disarmed. The next thing the treaty said, Germany had to pay war reparations. Put all this down. Germany had to pay war reparations. What are reparations? What are reparations? Comes from the word repair. What are, what are reparations? It's like when you give money back to like. If you do harm to someone, you repair that harm by what? Giving them money. Giving them money. If somebody knocks down your fence. On your farm, they just drive right down the ditch line and just take out your fence. They're going to be in trouble. They've destroyed private property. And they may even go to jail for that. But when the judge is giving the sentence, he may say, you're going to do 30 days in jail, and you're going to pay reparations. In other words, that farmer or whoever owns it, 
tally up what his fence costs, and you're going to pay him exactly what it costs to replace that fence. You understand that? That's what reparations are. We'll get this down. The Germans had to pay the big four countries. The Germans had to pay the Allies for all the destruction they had caused during World War I. By the way, <clears throat> why did, was Germany left holding? Why was Germany left holding the bag? Why didn't the Austrians have to pay anything? Why didn't the Ottomans have to pay anything? They're gone. There's no such thing as an Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's no such thing as a uh, Ottoman Empire. So here's another problem with this whole process: is that Germany is left holding the bag. And by the way, they set the price of reparations. Get this down at 132 billion Reichsmarks today. In Germany, they have the euro, but in those days, 132 billion in gold, in gold that the Germans had to pay to the Allied nations. Today, that would be several trillion dollars, several trillion dollars. And of course, what's the problem with this whole scheme right here? Germany's broke. Germany's broke. Very good. So here's what they did. So they, got this down. they set up a payments plan. And every year, except when Hitler was in power, he just canceled it. But every year, the Germans had to pay the Allied nations a, a payment in gold. Okay, a payment in gold. When did they finally get that? And by the way, they paid it off. When did they finally get it paid off? What year? It stopped for Hitler, and then when Hitler was dead and gone, they, when, the, when the German government was reformed after World War II, then they started paying again. How long did it take to pay this <coughs> off? What do you reckon the last year was of payments? Anybody just pick a year? 2018 wasn't quite that long. 2002, that's pretty close. <laughs> when were you all born? 2005, four. Anybody here born 2003? Two. Just for the record, you don't have to write. They paid until 1999, shortly before you were born. That's how long it took Germany to pay off this debt levied against them by the Treaty of Versailles. So they had to pay war reparations. Next, get this down. German acceptance of war guilt. They had to sign a document. The Germans had to sign a document saying that they had caused the war. Is that true? No. Who caused it? Austria. What? Austria-Hungary Austria did? What about the Bosnians killing that guy? No, wait a minute. What about the Bosnians? What about the Russians? You know, when, 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 when this Austrian Archduke gets killed, these guys come storming in saying they're going to help their fellow Bos the Slavs, the Bosnians, but they're really doing it to take territory. You know, why did Germany go to war to crush France? Why did France go to war to crush Germany and England? To crush Didn't I tell you that all these people had ulterior motives? Didn't they all have ulterior motives? So whose fault was it? Huh? Everyone. Everybody's fault. You understand, listen. Listen, you understand that 21,000 books have been written. I don't know how many have been written on World War I, but 21,000 books have been written on just who started the war, whose fault it was. If I brought 10 historians in here from prestigious universities and said, we've just got one question for you as a class, who's, who started, whose fault was World War I, you'd get 10 different answers. With 10 historians, you'd probably get 12 different answers. Nobody knows. I just read the latest thing on World War I. This guy is a British historian, great author, young guy, just starting his career, and he wrote a book about World War I. And you know who, who did he say started the war? This is a British historian, huh? Nope. He said England started World War I. He said it was England's fault. He said if England, his thesis, his theory, if England had not gone to war to rescue Belgium, the war would have stopped and there wouldn't have been a World War I. That's his theory. But he's got a pretty good argument. I'm not saying I agree with that, but he's got a pretty good argument. The point is there's enough blame to go around. Who is it, though, that couldn't be blamed for starting? Which nation involved in this war could not be blamed for starting the war? The U.S. The U.S., because we didn't get there until, yeah, well, 1918, really, but yeah. You understand that. But guess what? Germany had to sign a piece of paper saying we started it. That's a lie. That's not true. And by the way, <coughs> I've shown you a picture of the Hall of Mirrors, haven't I? Yeah? Well, that's where it was signed. 
and everybody that could cram. There were thousands of people that day because they knew they were watching history being made. And the big four, they were seated on a platform, and the treaty was like right here, uh, and the German delegate had to come right up there and sign it. And guess who was sitting right in front of the treaty where uh, the Germans had to sign? Who? No, no, Hitler. He's, he's, uh, Hitler's in a hospital somewhere coughing his lungs up. He's just some little, nobody ever heard of Hitler. Who's sitting there? Wilson. Wilson right? He's the big four. Wilson's right there. And when the German delegate, the guy who was going to sign for Germany, started to sign it, he looked up at Wilson and he said this. He said, in signing this treaty, in signing this treaty, I have signed my death warrant. And it made Wilson angry. And what did Wilson have in his hand? A pencil. And what did he do? He snapped it. Right? And he turned to David Lloyd George and he said, isn't that just like them? In other words, arrogant to the end. The guy signed it. A year later, he's walking through the streets of Berlin, and a German came up and shot him dead on the streets of Berlin. And when they arrested that German, they said, why did you shoot that guy that signed the Treaty of Versailles? He said, in signing, this, this guy was an ex-soldier who had fought in the trenches. He said, in signing that treaty, in signing that treaty, he betrayed Germany. So I killed him. The guy forecast his own death as he signed, as he signed that, as he signed that treaty. Okay. Also, get this down. A new government for Germany. Quickly, we're out of time. A new, go a new government for Germany. Get this down. What's the capital city of Germany right now? Come on, my sophomores. Should have learned this in the third grade. Huh? Berlin. Write that down. And it was the capital of Germany in 1919. It is right now. But the Allies, get this down, moved the capital. They said Berlin is no longer your capital city. They moved it to a city south of Berlin. They moved it to a city south of Berlin. There's Berlin. And they moved it to a city south of Berlin called Weimar. The Germans pronounced those W's as a V, the Weimar. Weimar was the name of the new capital city. And they also, get all this down, they also, we're talking about the Treaty of Versailles. They also created a new government for Germany. They said, you are going to be a republic. Can you name me another republic in the world? The United States. I don't care how many times Joe Biden and Donald Trump say that this. Well, I have to give Trump credit. He's, he usually calls it a republic. I have to give him credit. But Joe Biden is just democracy, democracy, and we're not. We're not. I don't care how many times they say it. The only way we can become a, 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 a democracy is to take this and run it through the wood chipper and say we're not going to have this anymore and write a new constitution and create a democracy. But anyway, I know what they mean when they say that, but they ought to say republic. It irritates me when they don't, okay? Um, you know, just like we have a president under this new German government, they would have a chancellor. Write that down. They would have a chancellor. <clears throat> what, is the what, is the what is the national legislature of the United States? Who makes our, huh? Who makes our laws? I taught you this, tried to last August, and I said, now in the spring, those of you that survive, we're going to be doing this, so you need to learn it. You need to learn things in school, not just write things down and make a passing grade on the test. You need to commit things to memory. Who makes the laws? What's the legislative branch of the United States government? Judicial branch. No, the judicial branch. That's the Supreme Court. They determine whether or not laws are constitutional. Who makes the laws? The House of Senate. The House and the Senate. What do we call them collectively together? What is the national legislature? Legislate means to make laws. I told you this in August. What is the national legislature called? It is the House and the Senate. Congress. Okay. This is the American Republic. This is the German Republic. It is a Congress. And the Germans have the Reichstag. They make the laws for Germany. Look, just a refresher, remember, there is 
the judicial branch, that is the Supreme Court. There is the executive branch, that is the president. Uh, and there is the legislative branch, that is the Congress, two houses, House of Representatives and Senate. You ought to commit that to memory, not for a stupid test, so you'll be an educated person. Educated people know things. They don't just have diplomas. They have the knowledge to back it up. And they're all independent of each other, but they all must work together for anything to get done. Okay? So anyway, the uh, Weimar Republic, get this down, the Weimar Republic was created by the Treaty of Versailles, okay? In 1919, it became the government of Germany. How long did it last? How long did the Weimar Republic last? Would anybody just guess? Somebody could... 19 years. What? 19 years. 19 what? Years. Well, how many years would that be? Let's see, that would be 29. Well, you're a little over. Huh? Until Hitler. Hitler took office in 1933. Get that down. Didn't last very long. And then he destroyed the Weimar Republic. Wasn't working. It was never popular. The German people didn't like it. You live in a republic. We're the oldest and greatest republic that ever existed. We are. Functioning Republic. The Roman Republic lasted 500 years, but it went away 2,000 years ago. Why do you think our government, well, this is, there are many reasons why our government is still survive, and this Republic has lasted for 240 years. But here's one of the main reasons. Get this down. Where did our government come from? Who created our government? I don't want their names and phone numbers. Which group of people created our government, huh? And who were they? I don't want a list of all 55, huh? Well, but who were they? Who created our government? You're overthinking this, huh? Well, it was based on an idea, but people had to sit out in a room and write. Who were those people, huh? Well, Washington was one of them. I'm not, again, I don't want their names as a collective group. Who were they? Americans. 55 people elected by, look, this is important. 55 people elected by Americans to go sit in that room. Nobody came over here and said, here's your constitution and here's the kind of government you're going to have. Our government, this republic, came from us. And that's one of the major reasons that it, is, it has succeeded. Let me tell you something. Trying to enforce a government on people rarely, if ever, works. Let me give you a modern-day example. What did we say we were doing in Afghanistan? We were creating, a, and we said, here, we go, here you go, Afghanistan. Here's your constitution. Here's your government. Here it is. How long did that last? 20 years, and it went away. It never really did exist, but 20 years. In Vietnam, we said to South Vietnam, we want you to be a functioning democracy. Here it is. How long did that last? 30 years. And it went away. Iraq, the same way. Governments forced on people rarely survive. One of the reasons our government has survived and flourished and provided year after year after year more and more liberty for more and more people, the reason that's worked is that it came from us. We created it. This did not come from the German people. And when Hitler comes along campaigning against the Treaty of Versailles, just a second, <coughs> that was ripe, ripe to be destroyed. Well, get this down, and it was destroyed. He destroyed that. Get this down. Melissa Schaefer, please come to the front office. Melissa Schaefer to the front office. The treaty... Uh, was signed on June, we've already done that, June 28th. And now, get this down, came, and I'm saying the word rat. With my accent, I may sound like I'm saying rat. I'm not, I'm saying ratification. The ratification battle for the Treaty of Versailles. I'm going to hold you over just a little bit. Look, the President of the United States can sign, go anywhere and sign any treaty he wants to. He could go to Guatemala tomorrow and sign a treaty with the Guatemalans. 
that he was going to give them Rhode Island. But what does he have to do once he signs that treaty? What? It has to come back and be approved by not the whole Congress. What? No, no, no. The judicial branch is the Supreme Court. It is separate from the Congress. It passed by who? The Senate. Write this down. And why, why does that? Why does it have to be passed by the Senate? Not passed. Why does it have to be? The word, get this down. The word ratify means to approve. It has to be approved by the Senate. Why Why the Senate? Territory of the states? No, that's an educated guess. Why are there three strikes in baseball? Not four. The rule book says there are three. Why, why does, does, does a, a, a treaty signed by the president have to be ratified by the Senate? The rule book says so. By the way, how big of a vote does it take? Two-thirds of the Senate. Two-thirds of the Senate. Well, I'm out of time. We'll take it up with two-thirds of the Senate come tomorrow. After your quiz. Study and get some points.